Hey folks, uh, we're here with Tim Schell, who runs our Center for Veterinary Medicine, and Sangela, good to see you as always. So today we're talking about something very interesting. Screwworm! <laughs> <laughs> Except what is screwworm, because I had to learn a lot about it. First of all, it looks disgusting. Yeah. And uh, you I'm going to show a picture. You have a couple photos there? Yeah, there's a couple photos in here, but Tim, just in case anyone is finishing their lunch as they're listening to this and about to vomit, here, we're going to facilitate that's, That's the warning I was going to give. You know, make sure you have not eaten recently. Yeah. Oh, there it is. There's a screw worm. Wow, so it looks disgusting, like a lot of parasites. But uh, Tim, tell us a little bit about it because it's been in the news a bit, but it's been something that you've been thinking about and working on and preparing for and planning for a long time. First, let me say I'm glad you didn't show the true infestation pictures. Oh, I've got those too. Really <laughs> right, that's the one you can't stomach. But yeah, screwworm is um, new to the U.S. in the sense that we haven't had it since the '60s. We had a small outbreak in the '70s. But screwworm is a fly. Um, the fly will uh, land on open flesh wounds and will deposit its eggs, and then the larvae hatch and the larvae burrow into the flesh and can cause uh, very serious damage to animals. And if it's not tr treated, it could be fatal for animals as well. So the uh, screwworm has been pushed to South America for many years. Uh, we managed to control it. But uh, since 2020, I believe, it started to move north. And it's about a few hundred miles south of the US right now. Um, our concern with it is that it could infest animals and come to the U.S. and cause uh, serious economic damage to our uh, livestock production here, specifically areas like in Texas where they have a very large cattle population, very susceptible. Um, we're concerned about wildlife bringing it over. And so our role at the FDA, the CVM in particular, is to evaluate the products uh, that could be used for treatment or for prevention of screwworm. And so we're busy trying to look at those products and be prepared for that. Um, and we've looked at a lot of uh, products uh, with the declaration of the emergency situation. It'll allow us to uh, evaluate products and see if we need to issue any emergency use authorizations. It'll, it'll allow us to speed up the process to get the information we essentially need to try to get products on the market as soon as we can. So maybe we should just uh, clarify for everyone why we're even talking about screwworm today, right? Because there have been some headlines around it. Well, this has been a problem that's been brewing. I've got some numbers here. There are roughly 89,000 cases in animals over the last three years in Central America. That, those are the numbers I have. And in some areas of South America, some have said it's endemic now. A couple of things everybody should know. Uh, what percent of cows in the world are infected with a parasite, nearly all of them. I mean, the vast majority. And so we're talking about a type of parasite that appears to be entirely treatable. And that treatment is, uh, there's a number of products out there I don't, probably don't want to say, but ivermectin is one of them and in that family of drugs. Um, but we are, uh, we probably should preface this by saying that there is no risk that screwworm will cause a pandemic or epidemic in humans. No one is worried about that. It, it's, it's so, there are so many steps that need to take place as you described for a- The uh, transmission pathway? Yeah, the transmission pathway. You have to have an open wound. You have to have exposure to flies that are you know, inspect, infected with the larva that um, then can land. You, have, you know, it would obviously start with a small wound or infection that would then continue to grow. So this were on a human, you'd quickly notice a wound or something, yeah. but on an animal, it can go unnoticed. So uh, this is really about protecting uh, uh, livestock and in a way that uh, makes sense and in a way that follows protocols so that people can know that um, the system's working. The USDA will in inspect essentially every single animal that goes in uh, processing meat, uh, poultry, and so that screening procedure would pick up an open wound, especially one, one of these gnarly wounds with larva. 
uh, infecting that. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, obviously, the, we're working with the USDA, and they're very aware of the situation, so they're very alerted to looking for these possibilities. So when animals are processed, they will look for those and, and pull them aside if they are there. So there's no concern about eating these products? No, no. And I think, you know, to go to your point about whether, you know, there's a human issue in the countries that have had this for years, right, there's only a few hundred cases in those countries altogether. So it's not something that rapidly transmits to humans that would be a big concern for so us. So put that in a scale, that's about less than 1%, less than 0.1%, I believe, actually, right. of exactly. cases are in humans. That's crossed over to humans. Yeah. And um, no, there's never been a reported case of somebody getting screwworm infection from eating beef. And so that's an important point. Yes. Now, that's not saying that's impossible right. for all of eternity, but there's in the tens of thousands of cases, right. never been a single report. Yeah, I think at this point, <clears throat> as you mentioned, products being available, we currently don't have anything approved for screw worm, but we do have some remedies that we think will work. It's just a matter of us getting the data and putting that information out in the hands of veterinarians and livestock producers so they use these effectively. Obviously, one of our primary concern is food safety, right? So we wanna make sure the withdrawal periods are followed and that the human food supplies remain safe. Can you explain what the withdrawal period is? Sure, that'd be the time they were treated with the drug to the time that they're eligible to go to market or be eaten, so. Well, that's it. I mean, this is in the news because there was a case of a human who had recent travel to Central America. Right. Who had uh, a, a case of screw worm. And so um, it didn't appear any, to be any serious health concern, but it is in the news. We want people to know we're on top of it. Uh, we've got this declaration that en enables us to move really fast with the authorization of treatments for animals with screw worm. And uh, it is one of these slow moving sort of, you know, endemic things in cattle that uh, we just have to keep an eye on and manage. I think obviously the USDA plays a really big role in this, especially we talk Customs and Border Patrol and keeping animals uh, from coming across, the USDA inspections. So there's a lot of uh, US government agencies involved in trying to protect us. From yeah, it's nice to see a coordinated public health response focused on preventing things, right? Yes. And it's nice to be able to talk about it. Yep. So I know, Tim, you know, we've chatted a little bit about kind of the broader CBM portfolio and your passion about a lot of areas. Um, you had a fun analogy, like, you know, you oversee pets and protein. So I kind of think about that, that analog. But what does, um, are there any interesting trends you're seeing in the animal space? Like, I think it's interesting. You mentioned this, some stat about pet owners consume more, spend more money than... Yeah, so uh, the, the pet industry is booming. Uh, people are very willing to spend money on their pets. Um, I think if you go to the grocery store, or certainly if you go to a pet supply store, the number of products available for animals is just incredible. Uh, we're talking mostly about feed, but also there's drugs that uh, consumers are interested in. They want to make sure they're available for their animals. They're spending a lot more on uh, treatments for like cancer, diabetes, you know, uh, uh, mobility, long-term things that you wouldn't normally see in pets. Consumers are very willing to pay for those now. So that's caused the increase in those kind of products for us to review and to make sure they're safe for animals. So we do see an influx of those now. Are you seeing any kind of trends in terms of uh, kind of the Maha movement as it relates to some of these products? Yeah, I think the concern would be things like, um, you know, the grass issue, whether these products, there could be products in my animals that have never been reviewed by the FDA. And the answer is yes, there could be because, you know, not everything has to come to FDA right now. Um, certainly, we would like to see that everything comes to the FDA for some type of review so that we can be sure they're safe. So that was one concern. Um, there are continually contaminants out in the environment. We talk a lot about the PFOS chemicals that um, are those forever chemicals that end up in the water supply, that end up in plants. You know, we've done a lot of activities around the PFOS to try to look at where they're coming into animals and they would eventually enter the human food supply. So there are a lot of Maha type things in the animal space as well. Wow. Do you have any pets? I was just going to ask. I do have pets. So. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I have uh, two dogs and one uh, cat right now. Okay. Yeah. What breeds? So I have a Border Collie and a, a Bernese Mountain Dog. Okay. Wow. Okay. Hey, Mr. do you have any pets? I do not. My wife's allergic, so although that's a little t too much information, and she'll <laughs> probably say, keep me out of this. <laughs> but um, is pet ownership increasing or decreasing? Uh, it's increased uh, quite substantially. So it's around... 
Uh, I think they said there's around 100 million pets in the U.S. now. About 70% of households have a pet in the house now. Wow. It's gone up in recent years, and there's some really fun stats. This was one of my favorite ones. So 26% of pet owners say that their dream job would offer paternity or fraternity leave. And so they're, like, <laughs> they're, they're looking. I think that goes to my point about them willing to spend money. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. And then to the money point, a third of pet owners spend more on their pets than they do themselves. And I think Ooh. it was like 15 or 16% spend more than their significant other. Ooh. <laughs> mm. So. No comment on that one. <laughs> yeah, it all depends how much you're spending on your significant other yeah, yourself. It's all, yeah, it's all relative. It's, it's a moving benchmark. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it's been interesting to learn a lot about the animal health versus human health. Are there any other parallels? You know, grass is a kind of common policy area. Um, Healthier food for pets seems to be a trend. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things to, to, to remind you of is when, when we feed our pets, we generally feed them a same diet. They get the same diet all the time. Usually if you get a brand and you like the brand and your animal performs well in the brand, you keep buying it, right? So the animal has a very limited uh, intake. And so if something's wrong with that, it, it can be very problematic. If it's deficient in a particular nutrient, the animal will suffer that consequence because it'll be long-term fed. Uh, if it has a contaminant in it, same thing, that it could potentiate a problem uh, much faster because that's the only thing they're getting. So you have to be aware of the fact that animals, you know, are kind of bound by what we feed them in a lot of ways. So we have to be careful what we're giving them is safe. Mm -hmm. And is it fair to say, you know, on the human product side, we've been talking a lot um, in these conversations around the importance of, you know, post-approval monitoring mm -hmm. and real-world data and uh, domestic manufacturing. Does that all kind of roll over to the animal side? All, this, all the same scenarios, right? We, we have a lot of our industry is abroad in, in the drug side. Um, and we depend on those products coming into the U.S. And it's a little scary sometimes when we have problems and the supply chain uh, doesn't allow us to have the products that we need. So we're a little aware of that. Um, and what was the other part you were mentioning? I, I forgot. Uh, you had mentioned kind of aligning the data submission pathways with the kind of a framework. You're modernizing a lot of them. Yeah, we're, we're spending a lot of time. Uh, one of the things that we've done at CVM in the last year is we've solicited ourselves for a lot of feedback. And so we're on the premises of being able to say, we got all this feedback, what are we gonna do with it? So we're in the position right now where we're evaluating all that input that we have and figuring out how we're gonna use it and what does that look like to move forward. Uh, I think it's fair for us to challenge ourselves and get the feedback to say, okay, how can we get better? If we don't ask for it, we're not gonna know. And we're gonna, you know, complacency is one of my big concerns, right? If we, if we sit there and think we're doing fine and everything doesn't need to change while the world around us does change, then we have a problem. So we've solicited a lot of input. Now it's up to us to implement those changes that can benefit our industries. And your background is in, you have a PhD, I understand, and uh, is it sort of animal health? So I have a PhD in pigs, so I'm a pig guy. <laughs> PhD in pigs. Yeah, that's right. And you're asking yourself, that's can what you your get diploma a PhD says, in pig? But... Yes. No, <laughs> specifically it's in swine nutrition. So I got a master's and PhD in swine nutrition. Okay. Um, and uh, it's a long story how I ended up there. I'm not really sure how I ended up there, but I did like pigs somewhere along the way. Okay. Did Wasn't that like birth or anything? You no, no, like no. I no. only study pigs my... Well, you know when you're in, in your high school and you say you like animals, what's the first thing they tell you? Well, you got to go to vet school, right? So, but, but you just don't know what the world looks like. And as I got into the animal world, I realized my interest was in uh, teaching and research. Mm. And you didn't really need to go to vet school for that, right? So I focused on teaching and research and moved in that direction. But did you grow up around pigs or anything no, like that? Oh, wow. I did not okay. grow up it is pigs. a fascinating animal. Yeah. I mean, they're smart. Um, they can essentially eat trash. Uh, right? <laughs> I mean, they, I, I don't know if I'd call that a plus, but yes, yeah. they can. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, my major professor actually did a lot of work on feeding trash to pigs. That was one of the things he did. I know in some very poor parts of the world, they, yeah. you know, they, uh, pigs are an important uh, form of sustenance because. Uh, you don't have, you know, where they don't have enough food for humans. Right. Sometimes the, p the pigs can survive. And so it is a fascinating animal. Uh, and of course, now there's a lot of research into uh, organs that come from pigs, pig farms that are uh, genetically modified uh, lines of pigs that are used for uh, experimental organ trans transplants. And um, I think one of those pig farms is in Blacksburg, Virginia. It is. It Isn't is. that where you did your PhD? Yes, they have a nice facility down there. 
Um, it's funny that one of the reasons I was interested in pigs is because they're similar to humans, right? So you could go into human nutrition, you could go into human medicine, you could say an animal medicine. So that's kind of one of the reasons that I was attracted to pigs, and it's it's worked out very well. Is it true that p- pigs have been sort of, in one experiment, taught certain tricks, frozen for an extended period of time, and when they thaw out, can remember those tricks? No, I have never heard that. <laughs> wow. I have never heard that. <laughs> That did not come from me. Okay, good. So many factoids there. Yeah. Um, so I know you were recently traveling in, was it Iceland? Yes. Was there any unique wildlife there that you saw? I don't know well, much about was, Iceland. Well, so the, there uh, turns out there's not much wildlife in Iceland. But what they do have is a lot of horses and they have a lot of sheep. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing about the sheep that we found was that in the U.S. you drive along, you see sheep and they're together. And the reason they're together is for protection, right? Because they fend off any kind of uh, predator. Well, in Iceland, they don't have any predators. Mm. So you will see sheep scattered all across the mountainside just by themselves in two and threes. And we were just fascinated that they were just everywhere all by themselves because so, mm. they had no predators. Hmm. So Kind of like buffalo out in Montana or something. They're yeah, just, just kind of doing their thing. Wow. So, yeah. Fascinating. Oh, fun. Well, uh, Tim, we're so thankful you're here at the FDA. You, you have a big distinguished career, and you're using your wisdom to help get products for animals across the finish line and get, uh, get decisions out. So um, thanks for being here. It's been great working with you, and I hope you enjoy these fancy new microphones that Bigfoot got us, or Michael, yeah. in conjunction with a bunch of folks. Um, I think it's pretty pretty good. We're we're yeah. starting to get some people were saying the audio quality was not that great. So um, thanks thanks for Bigfoot for setting this up. And I think Should we're, we vote we're on the cooking. couch. Do you, what do you think of the couch? You're the Works first well one for to me. try it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, there you have it. Uh, screwworm, pigs, uh, veterinary medicine, and getting to know Tim in a deeper way. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your household pets. If you've got some right now watching this. And uh, more to come.